want to jump into some music and worship together. I wanted to encourage you to stand and join with us uh, to do that. If you uh, so would like to stand, you're welcome to sit as well. There's other postures of worship that we can get into, but today we're going to just praise the Lord, give him, uh, give him our worship this morning, and uh, have a good morning together. Yeah. That's always a dangerous question, isn't it? Uh, but it is great to see you all here this morning. Thanks for coming out. I uh, want to make you aware of a couple important announcements. First off, uh, Dad, uh, don't miss that little coupon in the bulletin for a free piece of pie when you order a meal here at 210. That's good through July 31st, 2022. Uh, and so uh, be sure to, to put that in your wallet, okay? 
and then also next week, we start our summer service uh, timing and plan, and that's going to be at 10 a.m. right here in this room. Uh, it's going to be a blended service. We're going to have our traditional service folks joining us, and uh, so uh, 9.30, coffee starts being served. There will be coffee following, so we'll have coffee fellowships on both sides of the service. Um, and so uh, please um, be sure to uh, come and enjoy that time together. Uh, with that, let's continue to worship. going to share a new song this morning together and I want to teach you the chorus like I like to do so that way when we go to sing it I'm not singing it all by myself um, this song is called Waymaker and it's got some just great lyrics to be able to sink into the soul and so I wanted to begin to do that this morning uh, and we're going to just sing out this chorus once and then we'll jump in the song, here we go Touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. stop you never 
stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see that you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't feel you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. See the man I don't see it, you working. Even when I don't feel it, you working. Never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you working. Even when I don't feel it, you working. Never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. You ever have one of those songs where the truth just seems to hit you right there? This is one of those for me. All I can tell you is as I was, uh, as we were practicing this song, getting to learn it, I would come to the bridge and every time I could never finish it. <laughs> the words just hit so true. There's been so many times in my life where I felt like, where are you? It's not about whether we can see or feel him in the moment. It's knowing that he's there regardless. He's working. He's moving. And he never stops. And so maybe this song this morning is just for me. I don't know. Uh, but I would hope that the lyrics, even though they're repetitive, that they, uh, they ring true to you. That God never stops working. He's never stopped working with us. Thank you, God, for that. Thank you. It took me about a million times. That's how I was able to get to this point where we could sing it. Even when I don't see that you're working, even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop. Never stop working, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. We make a miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Cause you are. We make a miracle work, promise keep life. My God, that is who you are. 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 I'm singing out a simple song, a simple prayer, a 
simple word I'm lifting up with simple hands a simple cry for truth so Jesus I offer a simple confession I lift up Lift them up with simple hands, a simple cry for truth. And Jesus, I offer a simple confession. I lift them my hands to you. I sing out, I love you, song. You may be seated. We're going to enter now into a time of confession. In the sermon today, Pastor Dan is going to be walking us through the parable of the sower, and so we're going to pray through that um, parable today together. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for teaching us with your word. Thank you for giving us your word to take root in our hearts and to grow and to reveal to us who you are. God, as we think about the parable of the sower today, we recognize in the different types of soil that that seed of the word sometimes falls upon, we recognize ourselves. God, we think about the rocky path on which the seed falls and never takes root because the ground is hard. And God, we recognize ourselves in that ground. We know that sometimes we hear the word of your kingdom and we do not understand. We're too busy to stop and listen to let it take root. We ignore your word, God, or we rebel against it because we don't like what it says. Lord, hear us now as we confess those times that we have been like the hard path when your word falls upon us. Father, we think also of the rocky ground in which 
the seed of your word falls and it takes um, sprouts and flourishes for a short time, but it doesn't have that root. And when hard times come, the plant withers and dies. God, we know that we so often have been weak and rootless. We've enjoyed participating in the things of, of your kingdom. We have welcomed your word with joy, but we've only done so superficially. And we've not always let it take root deep within us. We've not always turned to you for strength in times of tribulation and adversity. God, we silently confess now those times that we have been like the rocky soil. Father, we also recognize ourselves when we consider the thorny soil in which the word, the seed of the word lands and takes root, but the thorns choke it out and take its life from it. Father, we know that while the seed of your word is growing in our lives so often, we are also nurturing the cares of this world, the love of riches, the love of pleasure, the love of the causes and agendas of this world. So God, forgive us those places that we have cared more for this world than for the truth of your word in our lives. Father, we confess that we are so often poor soil for, for in which you can grow your kingdom. But God, we know that you also have the power to make us good soil, that you are the farmer who nourishes the soil, who plows the soil, who breaks up rocks, who cuts through um, paths, who weeds out the weeds, Lord, in order to turn us into fertile ground for your truth and for your word. So Lord, we pray that despite our shortcomings, that you would forgive us, that you would work in our lives, and that you would make us vessels of your word in this world. Forgive us, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now hear the declaration of forgiveness. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will restore their land. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with all of you. Let's take a few moments to share God's peace with one another. Well, thank you all so much for giving that warm welcome to each other.
We are starting a summer sermon series today uh, that is entitled Flourishing Lives. And what we're going to look at throughout the summer are scripture passages that uh, speak about plants growing. And, uh, and the idea is that we want to learn from scripture uh, how God teaches us uh, that we can live flourishing lives following him. And the first passage we're going to look at is oftentimes referred to as the parable of the sower. And yet, we're going to look at it very much as if it is the parable of the four soils, the four different types of soil. And we're going to look at this passage today in Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 15. And you can follow along in your Bible or up on the screen. One day, Jesus told a story in the form of a parable to a large crowd that had gathered from many towns to hear him. A farmer went out to plant his seed. As he scattered it across his field, some seed fell on the footpath where it was stepped on and the birds ate it. Other seed fell among the rocks, and it began to grow. But the plant soon wilted and died for a lack of moisture. Other seed fell among thorns. Fell among thorns, and then I lost my place. <laughs> uh, uh, other seed fell among thorns that grew up with it and choked on the tender plants. Still other seed fell on fertile soil. This seed grew and produced a crop that was a hundred times as much as had been planted. When he had said this, he called out, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. His disciples asked him that, uh, what this parable meant. He replied, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of God, but I use parables to teach the others so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. When they look, they won't really see. When they hear, they won't understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is God's word. The seed that fell on the footpath represent those who hear the message only to have the devil come and take it away from their hearts and prevent them from believing and being saved. The seeds on the rocky soil represent those who hear the message and receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they believe for a while, then they fall away when they face temptation. The seeds that fell among the thorns represent those who hear the message, but all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. And so they never grow into maturity. And the seeds that fell on the good soil represent honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. God, we pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts would be found pleasing and acceptable unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. A common hindrance to our sharing the gospel enthusiastically with others is that we are aware that we aren't as transformed as we would hope to be at this point in our relationship with Jesus. We feel stuck in patterns of life that we know don't reflect a life being transformed by Jesus. To put it into metaphor language, if we go out to our garden, we likely see ourselves as the plant in our garden that isn't thriving in spite of having received as much water, sunshine, and fertilizer as the rest of our plants. We desire to see that plant flourishing, but instead, it's languishing. We see that in our lives as well. We are languishing rather than flourishing. And when that is the case, it's hard to proclaim the gospel to others enthusiastically. And that actually makes sense. 
because merely informing people about the gospel won't compel them to believe if they can't see evidence of significant transformation within our lives because of the gospel. We want to be witnesses who have noticeably transforming lives as a result of the gospel. If we aren't witnesses being transformed, then we aren't enthusiastic about sharing our faith with others. Now, right at the start of this sermon series, entitled Flourishing Lives, I want to make it adamantly clear that this sermon series isn't going to demand that you try harder and that you do better. <laughs> what I will encourage you to do through this sermon series is to surrender yourself to a deeper connection with God. Flourishing lives are characterized by spiritual fruitfulness and kingdom productivity. And the fruitfulness and the productivity will never be a result of just trying harder to live a transformed life. Instead, your fruitfulness and product productivity for the kingdom will always be a result of how receptive you are to letting God take care of you. God is the gardener. We are the plants in his garden. God is the one who is responsible for our health and yield. Today, we read the parable of the sower, and like I said, we are going to consider it more from the vantage point of the four types of soil in that parable. The soil environment is critical for plants to grow and thrive. If the soil environment is not able to provide what is necessary for growth, then the seed can't take root and draw on the nutrients necessary to be fruitful and productive. And uh, metaphorically speaking, our heart is the soil of our lives. And each type of soil that is addressed by Jesus in this parable reflects a state that our heart can be in at different times in our lives. What state is our heart in at this time in our lives? Is our heart in a state of being like a hard, packed path in which the seed known as God's word can't penetrate? Is our heart in a, in a state of receptivity to the word, but so filled with rock right below the surface that the seed won't be able to set deep roots, and therefore the plant will wither? These first two types of soil are what we are going to reflect upon today. All four types of soil are, in my opinion, representative of where our hearts can be as believers. The fourth soil isn't the only one representing Christians. The fourth type of soil does represent the heart of a flourishing Christian who is producing spiritual fruit and kingdom productivity. We should all be desiring to have hearts like the fourth type of soil. Yet there are times in our Christian walk where the word of God lands on our hearts and never sinks below the surface of our hearts. And there are times in our Christian walk where the word is received, but the word can't take root deep because of the rock right below the service, surface, inhibiting the seed from getting deeply into our hearts. Next week, we will talk about the weed-infested soil, and we will talk about the fertile soil. However, today, we focus on how a hard heart can become receptive to the seed and how a shallow heart can allow God's word to go deeper. First off, I want to give you a definition for flourishing that I think can help us best understand why some plants flourish. 
here's that definition. Flourishing, growing in a healthy way, especially as a result of a favorable environment. A favorable environment. Neither the hard-packed path nor the rock-filled soil are favorable environments for seed and plants to flourish. The path needs to be tilled, and the rock-filled soil needs to have its rocks removed. There is work that the gardener needs to do if the seed is going to take root and to flourish. And we must begin with asking our gardener to give us soil where the word of God flourishes within us. We must pray that God helps us receive the word by faith. It's not enough to hear the word, to merely have it land on the surface of our heart. We have to believe that the word is truth to be welcomed into our life. How do we welcome God's word into our lives? We pray for God to help us receive the word by faith so we, we let it penetrate below the surface of our heart. When you enter the sanctuary or the 210 assembly room or a church classroom where you know that the word will be sown, do you pray that God would grant you the ability to receive the word by faith? Are you desiring the word, whatever it may be about, to transform your life? You may say to me, well, pastor, that depends on what the word is addressing that day. <laughs> if it's a word about God's mercy and forgiveness, well, then I gladly welcome that word by faith below the surface of my heart. However, if it's a word about turning the other cheek and, give, and giving my shirt to the one who has wrongly taken my robe, then I will struggle to welcome that word by faith below the surface of my heart. Don't we all struggle with receiving the word about not retaliating? or about not demanding back what has been taken from us, I think we all can identify with how hard it is to let that word permeate the surface of our heart and go deeply within us. Retaliatory living and living to get back what has been taken from us, though, doesn't usually translate into a flourishing life. Recently, I saw the Batman movie with my three kids. Within that superhero action thriller, there was some recognition within Batman himself about the condition of the soil of his own heart. And yeah, I mean that. There really was. In the very beginning of the movie, the Batman is asked who he is, and he says he is vengeance. And that vengeance is the grounds for why he is a vigilante. Throughout the movie, we see the Batman taking vengeance against criminals similar to the criminals who 20 years earlier in the storyline had taken the life of his parents. At the end of the movie, after Gotham has ended up becoming essentially a war zone because of Batman's vigilante vengeance, Batman does some personal reflection. He realizes that his living out a life of vengeance won't make Gotham a safer or flourishing community. He doesn't use the term flourish, but essentially he has come to a place of realization that his vengeance activities weren't giving Gotham the environment it needs to be a flourishing city. What about us? Wherever we are resisting the word as not worth receiving by faith, then we are actually contributing to the reason why we aren't flourishing. When we recognize our stubbornness to God and 
to the teachings of Scripture, we need to counteract that by being still before God. We need to ask God to point out, why aren't we receptive to the word? We need to let God reveal why our hearts are closed to this particular teaching of Scripture that has landed on our heart. And don't I know <laughs> that what I am recommending absolutely terrifies some of us to ask God to tell us why we won't receive this particular word or that particular word. When I was a child and I skinned my knee, I would run to my mom to be hugged and comforted. She would want to look at the skinned knee and I wouldn't remove my hand to uncover it to her. Why? Because she was going to want to clean the wound. Cleaning the wound was likely to cause the scrape to hurt more than it already was hurting. Yet, if I had continued to refuse to let her clean the wound, it would have gotten infected and would, in the long run, hurt much more. So often, what makes us resistant to receiving a particular word of God by faith is a wound in our heart that we are covering up from God. We don't want him to clean it up and remove the potential for infection because we know for a bit it will cause that wound to hurt all the more. So often, our resistance to God's word has so much more to do with our wounds becoming infected, and the worse the infection becomes, the less we want to face the hurt that will be associated with letting God clean it out. Now, the second soil is receptive to God's word initially as good news. However, persons with rocky soil aren't expecting that there will come challenges in our lives as a result of following Jesus. Because they aren't anticipating challenges, they aren't emphasizing the need to let the word go deeply within them. I have the perfect illustration for this. God calls people into church leadership, and initially those persons are excited to get the opportunity to support the message in the ministry of the church. However, part of their enthusiastic response is that they assume that church leadership will be an unchallenging service opportunity. <laughs> then they attend an elder or deacon meeting. They learn things about fellow leaders that they don't always find so attractive. They discover weaknesses within their pastor. Perish the thought. <laughs> they find out that not every area of the church is as healthy as it could be, and quite possibly some parts of church governance are downright dysfunctional. If their connection to Jesus isn't very deep, and God's word hasn't become deeply rooted in their heart, then the word they have received by faith will hit rock. And as the challenges that come with spiritual leadership grow hotter and hotter, they will find themselves withering under the heat of challenge and persecution. The only way to survive when the heat of challenge and persecution comes our way is to invite God to break up the rock of false expectations concerning our lives as Christians. We have to give up the fairy tales that life will be an endless bowl of cherries for Christians. The apostles thought that their last trip to Jerusalem with Jesus <laughs> was going to be a coronation of Jesus. He was going to become the next king of Israel and they would sit on seats of honor in his throne room. After all, just a week earlier, Jesus had raised 
his friend Lazarus from the dead after being buried for four days. And the disciples knew Caesar didn't have the power to raise the dead, let alone Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of Jerusalem and Judea. Jesus, well aware that the disciples' roots had not yet gone deep, tried to prepare them. He warned them three times on their journey to Jerusalem that he would be arrested and he would be crucified. He told them that they had to be willing as followers of him to deny themselves, take up their crosses and follow him. He told Peter that he would deny knowing Jesus three times. Yet the rock of expectation that Jesus was going to be made the king of Israel without challenge made it seem unnecessary to, for the disciples to have to grow deeper that week. So on the night that Jesus was arrested, he led the apostles to the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives, urging them to pray that they would not fall to temptation. The apostles, absolutely oblivious, to the fact that their world was about ready to be turned completely upside down, didn't pray, but instead they slept. And when the challenge and the persecution came, they all withered. Now, we know that in the days that followed, these apostles didn't wither anymore. Somehow, the rock right below the surface that was not permitting the plant's roots to go deep was removed. How did the rock get removed from the hearts of the apostles so that the word went deep within them? They prayed. For the better part of 50 days between Jesus' resurrection and Pentecost, these apostles gathered daily to pray. And at the conclusion of those 50 days, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and the rocks had been removed from their hearts and God's word had sunk deeper and deeper within their hearts. And they began to flourish as they could proclaim the gospel and witness enthusiastically to their being transformed by the gospel, even in the face of of the persecution that was still so hotly on them. If you have a packed down, impenetrable surface on your heart, then be still and let God tend to your wounds. If you have rocks in your heart impeding the roots of God's word going deeply, then pray for the rocks of false expectations to be removed and pray for the ability to go deeply with God so you can withstand the challenges and persecution that will inevitably happen to us. I want to underline this. Praying isn't about working harder. If it feels that way, you're doing it wrong, okay? Praying is running to God like I ran to my mom when I scraped my knee. Praying is like gathering with friends and asking God to fill you all with the Spirit so we might be transformed and can flourish, just like the apostles did between resurrection and Pentecost. And they were ready for any challenge that came their way. Praying is as natural as those activities. So, it is my prayer that you and I flourish. Will that be your prayer for yourself and for the rest of us here at First Presbyterian Church? I hope so. Let's pray. God, we come before you knowing that today you're sowing seed. You're 
you're throwing it liberally all around this auditorium, Lord, and we know that some of it's landing on hard-packed rock. We know that some of it's being well-received, but it's going to be difficult to take root because it's going to hit some rocks that need to be removed. We know that some of that seed, Lord, is landing in soil where thorns and weeds are already planted and that are going to be growing up with it. But Lord, we do believe too that in all of us today, some of that seed has fallen on fertile soil. And we pray that it takes root. And we pray that it grows strong, that it weathers the heat, and that it reproduces itself 30, 60, and 100 times over so that more and more people as well are knowing what it is to live a flourishing life following Jesus. God, we want to flourish so that we can enthusiastically share the gospel and people not only hear with our mouths what we believe, but they see the evidence of your transformation in us in such a way that it appeals to their deepest desires for you, God. Lord, we ask all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Let us stand and let us worship with open hearts. You unravel me with the melody you surround. mother's room you have chosen me love has called my name and I've been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins God, we come to you today, want to intercede for people that we know and love and are very concerned about. Lord, we lift up to you, Buddy and Barbara Gillespie. Uh, Lord, uh, they recently lost a granddaughter. Um, and Lord, we know that the memorial service was yesterday. And so we just pray the presence of the Lord to wrap make the make it known to 
Buddy and Barbara, that you are wrapping your arms tightly and tenderly around them, comforting their souls. We pray that for the whole family. Lord, we also lift up to you uh, Sydney Little. Lord, she had major reconstructive surgery on Monday, 10 hours long on her leg and foot. And Lord, we're praying that all that hard work that uh, the surgeons did as your hands guided theirs, uh, that that would come to fruition so that her leg grows strong, steady, and um, truly able to carry her weight for a long time to come. Uh, Lord, there's a number of folks in our congregation, especially on the younger side, if you will, Lord, that are suffering from COVID at home. Lord, we're thankful that none of them are having to be hospitalized and um, that their symptoms haven't grown life-threatening, but we know that a lot of them, Lord, are feeling really under the weather. And so we are praying your healing hands upon them. And we pray for their families as they are striving to quarantine and protect uh, spouses and children from the spread of this virus, that uh, you would bless their efforts of quarantine and keep the uninfected uninfected. Lord, we uh, come to you today uh, praying about the war in Ukraine. And Lord, this last week, um, the missiles and the bombings intensified on the eastern side of that country. And um, Lord, more, more injuries, more lives lost. And um, Lord, this just continues to grieve and make our hearts heavy. And so we are praying that you are divinely working towards some divinely orchestrated plan for peace. And um, that's what we're crying out for, Lord. God, we also lift up to you, Uvalde, Texas, um, as well as Buffalo, New York, um, as well as um, the Irvine uh, Taiwanese Presbyterian Church, um, Lord, uh, places where uh, mass shootings have occurred as of late. They continue to need your attention, Lord, to love them, to comfort them, to counsel them. And uh, Lord, we do pray uh, that when it comes to the civil and legal decisions that can be made to keep people safe, um, that Lord, your wisdom is directing towards that end. Um, Father, we pray all these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You spent the season like a love right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stay. A child of God, you split the sea. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child. strengthened by God's spirit in your inner being and rooted and established in Christ's love may you give more and more power may God give you more and more power to grasp how wide, high, deep and far is the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge so that you may be 